Good afternoon. Um, welcome today to the uh, final of the RWA's four-part uh, Waterwise Ways for a Healthy Loan webinar series. Thank you so much for joining us here. Uh, my name is Dan Doyle with the RWA, and uh, today you'll be hearing from Gail Reynolds, a master gardener uh, for Yukon Extension. So, you know, for the past four weeks, we have heard from uh, a variety of experts about strategies that you can use to keep your lawns uh, green and growing and your gardens healthy. Uh, while reducing unnecessary water use, uh, using water wisely. Um, and, you know, because as we all know, water is an important pressure. It's a precious natural resource, and uh, it's important that we do what we can to protect it for the use of future generations. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, the RWA has about 27,000 acres of land that we protect throughout the region. Uh, we have environmental specialists like the one you may have heard from last week uh, who monitor that land, ensure the forests and uh, are healthy and that, you know, those are protecting the water sources. Um, and, you know, we ask that our customers uh, do what you can to help us uh, protect this, uh, protect water by reducing unnecessary use, particularly as we go into these uh, warmer growing months. Um, you know, and there are a lot of ways you can do that. We do find that in the warm months, uh, water use increases a lot and about 40% of it is outdoors. Um, so by implementing some of the practices that you've heard that last few weeks and are gonna hear today from Gail, uh, you can reduce water use, uh, protect this natural resource, and ensure that, you know, still your, your garden and your um, uh, lawns are healthy and growing. Um, before we get going, I'm just going to, you know, at the very end of the presentation, Gail is going to take some of your questions. Uh, what you want to do if you have a question throughout any point in the presentation, there is a Q&A box at the bottom of the Zoom window. Just click on that, enter your question in there, and um, once Gail's presentation is finished, uh, we'll go through and uh, answer as many of those as possible. If you think of a question after the presentation, you can also please email us at uh, waterviews at rwater.com. That's W-A-T-E-R-V-I-E-W-S at R-W-A-T-E-R.com. And um, right now I'm going to pass things over to Gail um, so she can introduce herself and begin the presentation. Gail? Um, thank you, Dan. Here I'm going to share. As, as Dan mentioned, um, I am... Gail Reynolds, and um, I am the Master Gardener Coordinator for the Master Yukon Master Gardener Program in uh, both Middlesex and New London counties. And um, besides educating people on science-based gardening, we also take um, questions from the public and perform um, lots of volunteer work on projects for municipal and nonprofit organizations. So the goal of this presentation is, first of all, to make sure that you know what you do in your backyard impacts the overall environment, and that includes water resources. Um, natural resources do not respect um, human um, boundaries, such as uh, parcel boundaries or town boundaries. So um, your activity can definitely impact others. Um, I'd also um, like to, you know, suggest ways in that you can reduce in your environmental impact when you landscape and garden. I would also um, like to uh, show you how native plants can provide aesthetic characteristics equal to that of non-native ornamentals. And um, I happen to be a forest ecologist and I have great love and respect for native plants. And I think people automatically dismiss them that, oh, that can't possibly bring you know, joy to my garden, but they can. And then finally, the mantra of the Master Gardener Program, right plant, right place. Meaning, um, you know, if a plant is not suited to be in a certain place, um, what you, in effort and um, re resources and money pour into it, really isn't worth what your outcome might be. So, is your backyard in a watershed? Um, this is a question that I often ask people. Similarly, you know, is your backyard in an ecosystem? And 
the answer is, of course, we all live in a watershed. Watersheds are not certain places, you know, neither are ecosystems. What a, what a watershed happens to be is if a drop of water falls and it infiltrates, where will it drain to? And, you know, it could drain to a, a creek, then another tributary and a tributary, and finally a major water body. But we all live in a watershed. And here's your typical Connecticut yard. You have non-native grass species. You have non-native ornamental trees and shrubs. You have non-native perennials and annuals. The vegetation is manicured. Um, it's fertilized whether it's needed or not. And it's watered whether it needs to be watered or not. And the impact of these processes on, on your ecosystem. Um, you know, all these non-native elements, they're not original ecosystem participants. Our um, ecosystems here in Connecticut largely evolved since um, the last ice age receded, which is quite a while. And these plants and animals and insects and, um, available minerals and water and air, um, you know, they have evolved over long, long, long periods of time called geologic time. And they are in an ecological balance. And this balance is not, it's not a rigid balance. It is more where, think if you have an equation that, you know, two sides are equal and a little thing happens on one side and a corresponding little thing happens on the other side. So even though there's constant change, you still have a balance. Um, but with all these non-native elements, this balance is much more difficult to achieve. And we humans compensate with applications of water, of nutrients, traps, pesticides, and then all the manual labor of mowing and raking and cutting. So what is a native plant? A native plant is a species, and this is talking about North America, because of course, uh, you know, European settlement is something that really changed our landscape in North America. But native plants are species that grew in a region prior to European settlement. And each um, you know, land area around the globe has their criteria for what a native plant is. But really a native plant is something that pretty much everything grew in its natural state until people showed up and introduced lots of different plants and animals and other organisms. Um, and as I said, these ecosystems of plants, insects, animals, et cetera, oops, um, originated after the last ice age with European migration and settlement here in North America and throughout our hemisphere, many species were introduced both um, deliberately and um, inadvertently were introduced from throughout the world. And Native Americans did bring in domesticated plants from South America, but the overall impact on our ecosystems was negligible. Um, we didn't have rampant, um, you know, uh, reproduction and of of plants that didn't evolve here to take over um, large habitats. You know, native plants are a way to lessen human impact on your backyard ecosystem because they are adapted to the balance within the local environment. There's very little watering outside of rainfall. You don't need to use fertilizers. You don't need to use pesticides and you don't need to mow. I mean, we don't water the forest. We don't fertilize the forest and we don't use pesticides or mow in the forest. And we can apply the same um, principles to our yards. Native plants provide all the aesthetic benefits of ornamentals, whether you're interested in color or texture, seasonality. And I will show some pictures 
at the end of this presentation. Native plants preserve our natural heritage. Um, if you are a birder, or maybe you love butterflies, um, it is these native plants that attract our birds and our insects such as butterflies for food and habitat. Because say for butterflies, non-natives can provide some nectar, but they won't provide a habitat. And native plants can control erosion and filter chemicals. In Connecticut, if land is left alone, it pretty much wants to be a forest. And we have all different kinds of forests, but Connecticut really wants to be a forest. So we have mixed hardwood forests. We have oak, hickory, beech, and maple as the dominant um, hardwoods. But there are other trees in there too. We have floodplain forests. I live very close to the Connecticut River and we have a uh, floodplain forest where we have cottonwoods, silver maple is a very prominent species, sycamores, red maples, pin oaks. These, these are um, plants that are adapted to, to live near water and often uh, have their root system submerged. We have some, some forests that are really only softwoods or conifers that are dominated by white pine and hemlock. We have hardwood uh, swamps where you'll find red maple, black gum, and you'll find you know lots of shrubs like clethra, um, uh, sweet pepper bush is, is found up in there. We have coastal white cedar swamps where we have dominated by Atlantic white cedar. We have dry hilltops where you might find pitch pine and scrub oak. We have some bogs. That's where you might find some black spruce, some tamarack or larch, and then lots of ericaceous shrubs, also known as heaths, um, cousins of mountain laurel. Things like sheep laurel, leather leaf, Rhodora, Labrador tea, um, uh, plants that stay evergreen and um, have uh, you know, thick leaves. Um, we have relatively few native grasslands and those are mostly on very sandy areas. We have salt marshes where you have cord grass dominating and, and um, you know, shrubs around the edges. And then we can have brackish marshes al along our, our waterways where we can have wild rice and other, other um, herbaceous plants. So lawns are not natural in Connecticut. Why do you need a lawn? Because everyone else has one is not a good answer. What lawns do is they introduce the European cold season grasses that require extensive effort to grow in Connecticut. Um, the native grasses in Connecticut are more warm season clumping grasses. These cold season grasses go dormant in the heat of summer. So if you wanna keep your lawn green during the really hot days of July and August, you are going to have to use excessive water for plants that really want to go dormant when it's hot. So here are some things that you can do. You can try to decrease the size of your lawn each year by extending your garden areas, or you can let like edge areas revert to natives. Um, this is if you're not ready to just ditch your lawn totally. You can consider native ground covers for parts of your current lawn. And then you won't have to water, you won't have to mow, you won't have to fertilize. If you have shady areas, you can stop trying to get grass to grow in them, um, but you can encourage moss growth because moss gardening is really cool. There are lots of nice mosses. They're native and um, you know they're nice and soft to walk on. So you can always do that. You can have your soil tested and add amendments and examples here are lime or fertilizer according to your soil test results. There's no need to fertilize and lime every year. Your lawn might not need it. And if your lawn doesn't need it, meaning that there is sufficient of nutrients there, 
when it rains, um, this excess fertilizer and other nutrients can wash off your lawn into the nearest uh, storm drain or water body. And when that happens, it upsets the balance of all the creatures that live in those habitats. Things that go directly into a storm drain generally are not, uh, you know, they're just piped into your, the nearest water body. So um, they're not filtered or anything and it's not necessarily good. Water only when absolutely needed. There's no rule that says your lawn needs water like one inch per week. That's not true. It just needs water when it's dry. And again, fertilize only if needed per your soil test results. The University of Connecticut, where I work, has a soil test lab. And if you send your soil sample into them, they will send you a personalized results page that tells you, you know, it shows you um, your um, nutrient levels and it will also make recommendations. If you mow, don't mow very close to the ground, leave two or three inch height because that fosters a deeper root growth uh, and reduces evaporation. So your lawn will, it might be a little longer, but it will be healthier. You can leave the clippings on your lawn as a natural source of nitrogen and other nutrients, unless you've treated it with pesticides, you don't necessarily want to do that. If you haven't, you can use that as a nitrogen sort, source and it, you can not need to fertilize. And the best time in Connecticut to reseed or renovate your lawn is actually in late August through late September. That's when you get optimal results. You can always overseed in the spring. And I think people are under the impression that the spring is the best time to do you know, all this lawn work. When really, if you must have a lawn and you need to reseed or redo late August through late September, that is the best time. Okay, um, if you must have a lawn, um, the, the little rhyme to remember is fescue to the rescue. Um, these grasses, they're not native, but these grasses do the best in Connecticut. There are turf type tall fescues, and then there are fine leaf fescues. These fescues require less water and fertilizer they are more drought and shade tolerant, and they are better at maintaining their greenness during summer heat. Here's another thing you can do in your backyard is you can put in a rain garden. And what a rain garden is, is it's not a place to put in a wet area. It's a place to put where you might have water constantly running, like say from a, from a, a a gutter spout or something. And water is very powerful and you don't want it to erode your hillside or wherever you have water running um, across a property. So what you do is you plant plants, shrubs, even some small trees, herbaceous plants. And what they will do is they will help collect the water and see that it infiltrates into the soil so you don't end up with an erosion gully. And these happen to be three rain gardens that I put in at my property. I've had them in here for years, probably 15 years. The water comes down this spout here, goes into this ground gutter, goes under, under the walk, spout comes out here. And then this vegetation here collects it and it infiltrates. The same thing here, we have ground gutters. The water comes off the roof into the ground gutters. And these are some shrubs. It's red twig dogwood and button bush, which both you know, have no problem with water and some perennials. And the water will seep right in here, infiltrate rather than flowing down here and eroding as it goes. And here on the other side of the front of our house, here is the ground gutter. It goes onto these rocks and then this is shady. So this is mostly ferns.
Now, drought resistant landscape. Many native plants will grow in dry places and they'll grow in your garden. For example, did you know that we have a native cactus in Connecticut? The Eastern prickly pear cactus grows along the shoreline up the Connecticut River and probably other rivers, but it will, it will grow in your yard. It has these beautiful yellow blossoms here. Each blossom um, lasts only one day, but when you have an established colony, it, you know, you'll have many blossoms over many days. It flowers late June through early July. You know, I just started growing it on a rock, so it needs very little soil. It's drought resistant, it's snow resistant. Um, I've had no issues with it. I highly recommend it. Also butterfly weed, which is um, a milkweed, loves it hot, dry sun. Uh, you don't need to water it. All the butterflies love it. In addition to monarchs here, we have an Eastern tiger swallowtail and a great spangled fritillary. You know, here are some plants that, you know, they're very attractive, they're easy to grow, they'll grow in your lawn or your garden. This is a plant here called Pussy Toes, Antonaria neglecta. And I bet if you looked in your garden, I mean, pardon me, in your lawn, you'll find some growing there because I have it growing there all around uh, what area I have that serves for lawn. And it's an early spring flower that attracts you know, the earliest butterflies. It's low to the ground and um, has these nice flowers. And it has, um, the, the leaves are, it's broad leaved, it's not a grass. And the leaves are a little silvery underneath. And here's another plant that's easy to grow. That's a native that you'll find in rich woods, especially along streams is golden ground cell or Pacera aurea, which will, you know, fill out um, a space very nicely. And um, the, the leaves tend to be, it tends to stay evergreen and the leaves tend to be reddish underneath. So you'll have some winter interest. Here are some other attractive natives. Um, Amelanchier, there are many species of Amelanchier. This happens to be Amelanchier canadensis. Uh, it's called shadbush, shadberry, juneberry, serviceberry. Um, but this is an early, it flowers early. Um, it has these lovely white flowers and I love this blue, blue sky. You know, they're, they're just finishing up flowering now. Um, blue sky before it gets hot and humid and we have smog and inversions. Um, and it has berries that are edible, but that's a pretty native, easy to grow. And here's another milkweed. It's called swamp milkweed. Asclepius incarnata, but you don't need to have it in a swamp. And um, monarchs love it. They will lay their eggs on it and reproduce on it. Um, this is another great spangled fritillary here. And um, here are some more attractive natives. We have here, this is Turk's cap lily, uh, a native lily. Here we have wild senna, senna hebacarpa. This is native to Connecticut, but I believe all uh, wild instances of it have been extirpated, but it's, it's in the pea bean family. It's a lovely addition to your garden. This is downy skull cap, which has these beautiful purple flowers in August, July and August. It's in the mint family, um, but it doesn't spread like um, garden mint. This is a uh, trumpet creeper, which is native to the Southeastern US. Um, it can get out of control, but I have it twining along a fence. So you just have to be vigilant about it. Um, it has beautiful flowers, hummingbirds love it. Here we have um, green coneflower or Rudbeckia lanceanata, grows to be probably um, over five feet tall, has nice coneflower flowers. Here we have good old black-eyed Susan very common, but easy to grow. Here we have a button bush um, flower. Button bush is a shrub. In the wild, you'll find it in swamps, but it will love growing on your lawn. And I used to think that the flowers looked like the Sputnik uh, satellite from the early 1960s. But now when I look at it, 
All I, unfortunately, all I can think of is the coronavirus, but it is truly a beautiful plant. And finally, we have a native Monarda, wild bergamot, Monarda fistulosa, it's purple. It attracts all sorts of um, birds and insects. Um, so, um, you know, you'll, you can't go wrong with any of these. And finally, here are some, you know, if you're interested in native plant lists, these, this is not an exhaustive summary by any chance, but, um, you know, the Native Plant Trust, they have a plant finder, if you're interested in native plants that, that grow in your area. Uh, Dr. Kimberly Stoner at the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station, she is an entomologist, and she has posted, um, you know, po for pollinators, sample lists of native trees and shrubs. Um, the Lady Bird Johnson Wildlife Center will um, show you uh, wildflowers for your zip code. USDA also has lists. The, the Xerxes Society, which is um, a nonprofit organization based on promoting pollinators has lots of great information um, at their website. Here is a, a link to a handout for Northeast pollinator plants. The University of Rhode Island has um, a native plant finder and Rhode Island's close enough that we, you know, we can use it for Connecticut as well. And finally, um, the National Audubon Society also has um, native plant uh, recommendations. So that is my presentation, and I will gladly um, take any questions now. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the presentation. Um, so I'm going to start going through the questions. Uh, Gail, I had no idea that there was a uh, Connecticut native cactus. Um, oh yeah, that was I, I was very interested to hear that. So um, let's let's start looking at some of the questions here. Uh, first person, someone asked, where are some good places to buy native plants? Um, well, you know, with my Yukon hat on, I'm not supposed to make recommendations because we don't want to um, seem like we're favoring one vendor over another. However, Earth Tones Native, Earth Tones Native Plant Nursery in Woodbury, um, they have wild type pl native plants and they're, in my opinion, the best native plant nursery in Connecticut, because that's all they have is native plants. Uh, also the Native Plant Trust, which is in Massachusetts, not too far. There's, um, they have the Garden in the Woods site in Framingham. And then they also have the Sami Farm, which is, I believe in Waitley, Mass. It's right off I-91. It's just north of Northampton. Those are also great places where you know you're getting you're getting um, wild type plants. Other nurseries um, will carry natives. Sometimes they have cultivars, and there's research now on whether cultivars and what a, well what a cultivar is is that horticulturists play around with plants. They keep breeding them and breeding them together to um, because they, there are some de desirable features that they want, maybe a color or maybe a height or um, something like if you have um, say a variegated plant, meaning it's like white and green on the leaves, you don't normally see those in the wild. So that could be a cultivar. Um, and some cultivars are not grown from seed, they're only propagated vegetatively so there's no genetic diversity and there's a lot of research going on right now in ecological circles to see if these cultivars have uh, you know adverse impacts on our pollinators and other participants in our ecosystems but most other nurseries if you ask you know for for natives or if you have something in mind they can get it for you um you know, I know like Nature Works in North Brantford has some natives and Balix in East Haddam has some natives and um, Town and Country in Haddam does and Broken Arrow in Hamden does. But, you know, the, the best native plant nurseries are the ones that are all native plants and all wild type. And I've told you my favorite. So 
And I actually, it's funny, I, I see someone, uh, one of our attendees um, suggested nature works in Northford uh, themselves. Uh, and, you know, do you find in general, uh, if you're looking for local or for uh, native plants, it's better to look at a local nursery as opposed to, you know, a, a larger store? Or um, Yes. I mean, I would stay away from the big box stores because you don't really know what you're getting there. Sure. Um, but, um, I mean, the local ones, it depends on, um, you know, how much of a horticulturalist they have on staff and, you know, whether they really understand native plants, because I know I've gotten calls from people who say, well, I hired this nursery or I hired this, you know, contractor to come do my garden to redesign it. And they, I told them to use natives. And then I find out that they didn't use natives. And, you know, there's no rule. It just depends on what people know. And, um, you know, you have to do some, some research. Okay. Uh, next question. So um, this person wrote that she has a ton of butterfly weed, but they get covered with those red milkweed bugs. Uh, she doesn't use pesticides. What would you recommend? Um, the red milkweed bugs are fine. They are just another insect that uses um, the butterfly weed for habitat. They're not going to hurt the plant. Even there's another native moth, the milkweed tussock moth, that can come through and the, the caterpillars can totally defoliate your milkweeds, but it's fine. They're perennials, they grow back. It, you know, nature, they've evolved. It's the timing is right. These um, caterpillars will do this, but only after the milkweed has gone to seed. So, you know, it's reproduced for the year. So um, that's, you know, there are several milkweed beetles and bugs and they're you know they're all fine the only one that can be that really can be a problem is some the oleander aphids that sometimes come by um they're aphids and they can you know make things um aphids their excrement is called honeydew and it's sticky and then ants come and eat it and it can uh cause fungal growth and um, the thing to do for them is to catch it easy and just hose them off. Okay. Um, thank you. The, so the next person, uh, just mentioning that, as I think you mentioned uh, Incarnata earlier, I'm sorry if I'm spelling, yeah. I pronounced that incorrectly, just wanted to reiterate that it smells very good as well as the uh, uh, values that you pointed out. Um, the next person asked, uh, you had mentioned native ground cover, is using native ground cover instead of a lawn. Uh, what are some types of ground cover that you would recommend? Um, okay, for shade, um, um, native um, ginger, uh, Acerum candidens. It is not the ginger that you eat, but it will, you know, cover ground. It's low to the ground, beautiful foliage, beautiful little red flowers underneath the foliage. Um, you can use um, like a wild, wild strawberry is a great ground cover if you just let it grow. Um, you can get different uh, sedges or grasses that are native uh, clump in their clumping. And you can just cover an area with them and you won't have to mow it or just mow it once a year. Um, you can do that. There's um, some others that flower like um, there's uh, Chrysogonum virginicum, I believe it is green and gold and that is a, you know, just a low nondescript plant with really beautiful yellow flowers. That flower from the beginning of May through the end of June. Um, there are, um, you know, those are just a few. Okay, thank you. As, as we conclude this um, and the weather continues to warm outside, it's looking pretty nice today. Uh, I hope that uh, everyone watching will you know, consider putting together some, putting to use some of the strategies that you've heard from Gail today and from some of our past presenters uh, to, you know, ensure that garden and lawn are healthy and growing, but um, reduce unnecessary water use and, uh, you know, help protect this important natural resource. Um, so with that, Gail, did you have anything else to say? We... Well, I hope that a few people will just consider planting a few more natives. Absolutely. No, if that's... just one person does, I will have accomplished my, you know, my task here. Absolutely. No, that, that's, that's so important. I know, I know we try and keep, you know, we try and remove all the invasives off our property and uh, uh, it's very important to use native plants. So 
Um, with that, thank you so much, Gail. Thank, thank you, everyone, for, for thank watching. You. And uh, I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day.